When you think about businesses that are selling through the roof, like Skims or Allbirds, sure, you think about a great product, a cool brand, and great marketing. But an often overlooked secret is actually the businesses behind the business, making selling and for shoppers buying simple. For millions of businesses, that business is Shopify. It's home of ShopPay, the number one checkout in the world. You can use it to boost conversions up to 50%, meaning way less carts going abandoned and way more sales going through to checkout. Upgrade your business and get the same checkout all birds uses. Sign up for your $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash income, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash income to upgrade your selling today. Shopify.com slash income. Ryan Reynolds here from Mint Mobile. With the price of just about everything going up during inflation, we thought we'd bring our prices down. So to help us, we brought in a reverse auctioneer, which is apparently a thing. Mint Mobile Unlimited Premium Wireless. Ready to get 30, 30, ready to get 30, ready to get 20, 20, 20, ready to get 20, 20, ready to get 15, 15, 15, 15, just 15 bucks a month. So give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 up front payment equivalent to $15 per month. New customers on first three month plan only. Taxes and fees extra. Speed slower above 40 gigabytes in detail. Hey friends, I'm Rachel Grohl and I'm your host for the Hearing Jesus Podcast, where I help you to know God and to make Him known. Today, we're diving into the story of the rich young man from Mark chapter 10. And if you're just joining us, we are working our way through the gospel of Mark in a series that really encourages you to lean into what it means to be a follower of Jesus, what it means to be fully devoted, what it means to live a spirit-filled life. And we're doing that Sometimes with a whole chapter at a time, sometimes just a handful of verses, I'm trying to be pretty spirit-led with that. And so today we're doing verses 17 through 31. The passage that we are studying today is known for being a challenging lesson, and typically it's taught within the context of wealth and sacrifice and what it truly means to follow Jesus. But at the heart of the story, we see a man who does sincerely want to know how he can inherit eternal life, but He's just not ready for the answer that Jesus gives him. And so his wealth becomes a stumbling block, and that prevents him from following Christ fully. And it brings up these deep questions about where our security lies. I think there's a lot of sides to this story, and wealth doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing. I think it's how you hold that wealth in your heart. There's more to this passage than just a conversation about money. It's really this lesson about how impossible it is to earn our salvation. And it's a reminder that when we follow Jesus, it requires something of us. It requires us to surrender and fully trust God with everything in our lives. So we're going to be reading from Mark chapter 10, starting at verse 17. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. I'm going to stop there for a minute before we go on. I just want to point something out. You know, one of the things about Jesus is he always tells us the truth. But in verse 21, it says, Jesus looked at him and loved him. I think it's important to remember that when we're speaking the truth, we do it from a place of love, speaking the truth in love. That's a powerful precursor for people actually receiving what we have to say. So as we open up this passage, what we see is a man that's coming, running up to Jesus. At this point, he's eager. He's respectful. 
He's asking the questions that many of us ask, and we probably have had that thought in our brain before. What must I do to inherit eternal life? What do I do to get into heaven? How can I have a right relationship with God? I think it's a question that has been on the hearts of everyone. And it's not a strange question, especially in a world where people are constantly looking for ways to have independence and feel secure about their future. In our context, usually in America, that means it's finances. But sometimes that means relationships or sometimes, you know, what we see here is it's spiritual. And so this man is earnest really in asking about his eternal life because there's this indication where he's looking for this assurance. But it's in a way where it's almost as if he's checking off the boxes in his mind as Jesus goes throughout this list. And he's checking off these boxes in terms of things that he's already accomplished. And so his question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? It's really pretty significant. It it reflects this mindset that many of us have, even if we're already followers of Christ. We can often think in terms of tasks or goals or achievements. What must I do? It's almost as if we believe that our connection to the Lord, eternal life, is something we can earn. Even if we don't admit that or say that out loud, if we're thinking about it in terms of what we have to do for God, what are the things that God is calling us to do in terms of salvation, then yeah, that's what we're looking at it as. And the response of Jesus reveals this deep truth that has to shift the focus from what we do to what we must become. We get into heaven by relationship with Jesus, not by anything we do, not by anything we accomplish, simply by relationship, by believing in him. And so Jesus responds, and it's kind of surprising when he says, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. And that kind of seems like a strange direction to take that questioning. But what Jesus is doing is trying to redirect his thinking. So when the man calls Jesus good, it's almost as if he's appealing to Jesus as a moral teacher, someone who can provide him a step-by-step guide almost to eternal life. Because by the way that he is listing off these things, there's this indication where he's wanting to cover all of his bases. He's wanting to do all the things. And so Jesus wants the man to recognize what's deeper, that goodness, true goodness only comes from God alone. And then that sets the stage for this next part of their conversation where Jesus shifts the focus from external obedience to this deeper heart level transformation. And the reality is, is that's the hard part for most people. We can look like we're Christians on the outside. We can look like we're, we've got it all together. We're going to church Sunday morning. We're going to Bible study Wednesday night. Maybe we're even leading Bible study Wednesday night. We're going to food pantry on Saturday morning. We're doing all the things. But Jesus is concerned about the heart. What we see next in this conversation is Jesus points the man to the commandments. And those are some very clear ethical guidelines that anybody in that culture and familiar with Jewish law would know. And he lists them. Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't lie. Don't defraud. Honor your parents. It's a very familiar list. And it's a reminder of the basic moral framework that God has given. But the man's response is immediate. Teacher, I've kept all these things since I was a boy. I think sometimes we act just like this guy, even if we don't realize it. It's easy to relate to him because when we feel like we're doing a good job, it's almost like we're ticking off this spiritual checklist. We're convinced that we're doing all the right things. He probably was doing all the right things. You and I are probably doing all the right things. But the reality is, is being good isn't the point. Following the rules, even faithfully, does not guarantee eternal life. And that's where Jesus begins to turn the conversation on him. I'm going to read verse 21 and verse 22. It says, Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looks at him with love. I don't want you to miss that. And if you don't get anything else from today's episode, I want you to hone in on that. Jesus looks at him with love. The perspective of Jesus, even when he's telling him this hard truth is love. It's a powerful moment. He doesn't look at the man with condemnation. He doesn't look at him with frustration. He looks at him with compassion. Jesus sees that this man is trying, 
but he also sees a deeper issue. He tells a man, he's just missing one thing. Go sell everything you have and give it to the poor, and then you will have treasure in heaven, and then come follow me. Does that mean that wealth is a a precursor, that we can't have wealth in order to get into heaven? No, that's not what he's saying. The moment of truth happens when Jesus challenges the man to not just obey the commandments, but to give up everything, the things that he is seeking for security, for his identity. The man thought he was ready to follow Jesus, but he wasn't ready to let go of his wealth. And so when that man's face falls and he walks away, he's grieved because he had a lot of money. But kingdom impact is made with money for sure. But you have to hold that wealth loosely. If you're gripping onto it, if it's part of your security, if it's part of your identity, that's where it goes wrong. This part of the story is uncomfortable for a lot of people. And for good reason, because especially in America, where the American dream is to, you know, have the house and the car and the country club membership and all of those things. It's a challenge to not just people that are rich, but anyone who's holding on to something tightly other than God. You know, I'm guilty of this too, to be perfectly honest with everything that's going on with our culture and the society and all the things. I went to Sam's Club two weeks ago and I stocked up with way more rice and beans our family is ever going to need, with way more canned goods than we need, with way more toilet paper than we need. Why? Because I spent way too much time watching the news and starting to feel insecure about our future. And we have kids. Now, it's not that we shouldn't be prepared for emergency. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is I immediately went to myself, my own wealth to be, and I'm not going to say wealth, I guess my own finances to be the thing that was going to make me feel secure. And it wasn't until I got everything home and I put everything away and I had to find space for everything that I started to turn to the Lord. And he said to me, don't you trust me? Now we live in an area that we would probably be fine if something crazy happened. We have woods and we have animals. My husband could hunt. We have a big garden. We, you know, we have a, a creek that runs through the side of the, the property. We would be fine. But instead of relying on God, I immediately went to myself. I think that's an indication of where our heart's at. And I had to repent for that. I had to spend some time with the Lord just getting my heart right. And maybe for you, it's not money, but there are things that we all have that we rely on, things that we hold on to, to make us feel secure. For some of us, that might be money, but for others, it could be relationships or our reputation or maybe our career or even our own moral righteousness, right? The reputation we have as a Christian, what people think of us. Jesus wasn't just talking about money. He was talking about anything that stands between us and a total surrender to God. And so this man's wealth happened to be the stumbling block in his life. But for us, it could be something entirely different. And so the question that this passage asks us is, what are we not willing to give up in order to follow Jesus? In our culture, that concept of wealth can take many forms. And so whether it is financial security, meaning having enough money in the bank to feel safe and prepared for an emergency, or maybe it's social approval, maybe it's a like count or a follower count on our social media platforms, or the validation we receive from others when we live up to this expectation, whether it's from our culture or our family, it might even be our own independence where we can hold tightly to this belief that we're in control of our own lives or our careers or our futures. As an entrepreneur, I meet a lot of women that are very dependent on themselves and they are type A personalities where they don't want to depend on anybody else. Any of those things can be stumbling blocks in a relationship with the Lord. This episode is brought to you by State Farm. You might say all kinds of stuff when things go wrong, but these are the words you really need to remember. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. They've got options to fit your unique insurance needs, meaning you can talk to your agent to choose the coverage you need, have coverage options to protect the things you value most, file a claim right on the State Farm mobile app, and even reach a real person when you need to talk to someone. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. With ring cameras and doorbells, it's easy to keep every fright in sight. See who's there. Keep your scaredy cats company. Oh, it's okay, sweetie. I'll be home soon. 
and protect your crypt from the real monsters. Oh, come on. The sign says take one. Find dead simple ways to stay connected right now at ring.com. So this passage is this reminder that no matter what kind of wealth we're clinging to, spiritual wealth, emotional wealth, financial wealth, it has a potential to become an idol. And so when Jesus tells that rich young man to sell all he has and give to the poor, it's not a general rule for all believers, meaning everybody that has any money should go give it all away. But he is addressing the specific idol in this man's life. And he's showing the man, and he's showing us, that anything that we place above God is a barrier to a true relationship with him and true discipleship. And so after the man leaves, Jesus turns to his disciples and he makes this statement. He says, how hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? And the disciples are kind of shocked by that because at the time, wealth was seen as a sign of God's blessing. So if someone who is wealthy and follows the law can't make it, well, in their mind, well, who can? Let me read verse 23 and 24. Actually, I'm going to go read through 27. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, children, how hard is it to enter the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. So here, Jesus is driving the point home even further with this image of a camel trying to go through the eye of a needle. It's an impossible task. And that's exactly the point that Jesus is trying to make. It is impossible for anyone, if they're rich or if they're poor, to enter into the kingdom of God on their own. It cannot be done by your own effort. And so when the disciples hear this, they are just kind of astonished. They don't know what to think. And so they say, well, who then can be saved? And Jesus responds, with man, this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God because there is hope where the gospel shines through. No one can earn their way into the kingdom of God. Not the rich man with his possessions, not the religious man with his rule following, not even the disciples who have given up literally everything to follow Jesus because salvation is not about what we can do. It's about what God can do. It's about grace. And so this is a message of hope. If we're honest, we all have things that we don't want to let go of, things that we struggle to surrender to God. I have them, you have them, we all have them. But the beauty of the gospel is that it's not about our perfection. It's not about our ability to give everything up. It's about God's power to work in us, to change us, and to save us. And so the statement about the rich entering the kingdom of God, it reminds us that it's only through the grace of God that anyone can be saved. Salvation is not something that we can purchase or earn or negotiate. It's a gift. It's a gift that God gives us freely. And it's a gift that calls us to live in complete dependence on him. And then our buddy Peter, he speaks up at this point and he wants to know what this means for them or for those that have already made sacrifices. He says, we've left everything to follow you. And I can hear it in his voice. I don't know if you can, but there's this sense in his words where he's looking for assurance. Like, hey, we've already done all that. After all of that, even we're not safe. And so the disciples Remember, they've given up their livelihoods. They've given up their homes. They've given up their families to follow Jesus. And let's read what he says in verse 28 through 31. Then Peter spoke up, we have left everything to follow you. Truly, I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children and fields, along with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. Jesus reassures Peter and the disciples by telling them that anyone who is left behind their homes or family or fields or namesakes will receive a hundredfold in return. But he also adds this key detail. He says, with persecutions, following Jesus comes with both reward and hardship. There is a great blessing in following Christ. Don't get me wrong. And we see that time and time again throughout the gospels, but there's also suffering 
Jesus doesn't sugarcoat this. That's the reality of discipleship. It's not just about the reward. It's about walking the path of sacrifice, just like he did. Because the life of a disciple involves both, both the blessing and the challenge. And then Jesus ends with this statement, which I think is powerful. He says, many who are first will be last and the last first. See, God's kingdom turns this expectation of the world upside down. In God's economy, things like humility and sacrifice and service are way more valuable than things like wealth or power or platform. And so this message is crucial for the disciples to get it. And they still have it in their mind that there's going to be greatness and power and success because of their obedience and their alignment with Jesus. And what he's trying to explain to them is what's actually going to happen and the challenges they're going to face as they walk with him. You know, one of the things that I try to remind my friends of is especially after we've done something really great for God, maybe God has used us in a particular area or whether it's a ministry session or whatever it is. And it's one of those mountaintop experiences. Maybe it's a mission trip. The flip side of that is there's always something that I call predictable resistance. We get home, we get, you know, barely off the plane and then boom, the car breaks down or boom, there's a fight with one of the kids or boom, you know, that paycheck that was supposed to come falls through, whatever it is. There's predictable resistance because the enemy wants to kill, steal and destroy the things that we're doing for God's kingdom. It's predictable because the resistance always happens. And that's not always easy. It's not always fun, believe me. But we take the suffering along with the blessing. We keep going because in this world, this fallen world that we live in, there's going to be brokenness. Until we get to heaven, we're not going to see that completely restored. In this passage, There's an invitation for us to examine our lives and our hearts. I think a lot of us are like that rich young man where we may think we're doing everything right. We're checking all the boxes and we're living in this way that looks like it pleases God. But Jesus looks behind that. He looks at those actions. He looks at those things we're doing and he asks us to look a little bit deeper. So what are the things that we're holding on to? What are the things that are preventing us from fully surrendering to him? What are the things that we're afraid to let go of because they've given us a sense of security or comfort or identity? Maybe not all wealth is like the man's in this story, but we all have things that we value and protect and sometimes even make an idol. Jesus challenges us to trust him enough to release those things, to recognize that eternal life comes not from what we do, not from what we accumulate, not from what we achieve, but by surrendering it all to him. And friend, he can do so much more than than we can with it anyways. I think one of the things that I've really been intentional about teaching our kids is about God math, even in the concept of like the tithe. God can do way more with our 90% than we can do with our 100%. It's a biblical principle that we see as we live it out, God is faithful in. And I just want to point out before we pray that there's so much grace here. The standard for entering into God's kingdom is impossibly high, so high that we cannot reach it on our own. But God does for us what we cannot do for ourselves That's why he sent Jesus. Salvation is this gift of grace that God has given us through Jesus. And so this passage reminds us that we don't have to earn our way into heaven. We are invited in. We just have to receive that gift with open hands. You don't have to try harder. You don't have to do more. You don't have to prove yourself worthy of God's love. The interaction that we see between Jesus and this young man is that exact point. It's not about what you do. It's about what God has already done. This call to discipleship is not a call to perfection. It's a call to trust God's grace and to follow Jesus wherever he leads, laying the things down that get in the way, knowing that he is going to provide what we need. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you with open hearts, acknowledging that we often hold on to things that keep us from fully following you and trusting you. God, whether it's wealth or relationships or control or status, God, we ask for the grace to release these things into your hands. 
God, help us to trust you completely, knowing that you are the source of all that we need. Lord, teach us to be humble, to serve others, to live for your kingdom above all else. God, thank you for the gift of your grace, for doing what we can never do on our own. We recognize that salvation is not something that we can earn, but a gift that you freely give. Help us to receive it with childlike faith, trusting in your goodness and your power to save. As we walk this path of discipleship, God, give us the strength to endure the challenges and the courage to follow wherever you lead. May we find our treasure in you. May our lives reflect your love and your grace and your mercy to the world around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Do you like to shop? You know that I do. So I want to let you know about some extra resources I have over at my online store at shehears.org. They're designed to help you grow in your faith. Whether you're looking for a new Bible or Bible tabs or even additional Bible studies, I've curated a selection of some of my favorite things that I think you are really going to love. For our podcast listeners, I'm offering a 10% discount when you enter the code PODCAST. Again, head to shehears.org and use the code PODCAST for 10% off. Greetings and God bless. This is Tyler Burns. And this is Dr. Jamar Tisby. And we want to invite you to check out our podcast, Pass the Mic, Dynamic Voices for a Diverse Church. Pass the Mic has been speaking directly to the core concerns of Black Christians for over a decade. On our show, we've got interviews from theologians, historians, actors, activists, and so much more. Not to mention heartfelt, open dialogue on some of the heaviest issues facing the church in the United States. Be sure to subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. We'll see you there on the next Pass Pass the the Mic. My name's Preston Sprinkle, and I host the Theology in the Raw podcast. Theology Raw aims to help believers to think Christianly about theological and cultural issues by engaging in curious conversations with a diverse range of thoughtful people. I have conversations with a wide range of different guests who come from different perspectives and no topic is off limits. Sexuality, abortion, politics, LGBTQ, warfare, violence, marijuana, immigration, you name it. If you have a theological or cultural issue that you have been wrestling with, with over 1,100 episodes, we've probably talked about it on Theology in Raw. Along with conversations with various people, I also address questions sent in from my audience every month. And occasionally, I will talk about some of my latest research projects that I'm currently working on. Theology in Raw is not for everyone. It is uncut, uncensored, and I don't give trigger warnings. So check out Theology in Raw through your favorite podcast app.